Let me also start by acknowledging the Jewish who which we meet in this case where I am the Nation and respects to their elders past, present, and in the This is an hour session, and I'm very conscious that there is probably nothing worse than sitting at this hour of the morning. Uh, probably everyone in the room, but they're not really meant to leave their chair. Uh, and if I just look at you for the entire hour, uh, you will probably feel a hint of nod. So, my objective is to speak to you about half the time we have allocated and then to give you the opportunity to raise the questions that undoubtedly you will have. So, let's see how we go again. You would have all seen, I'm sure, the economic data that was yesterday. Uh, we are now categorically. And I don't think anybody needed to see the ABS data uh, to understand that reality. We are experiencing it in our personal lives, in our lives. And I think most of us, we all understand that these are, to use the word of the pandemic, unprecedented times. No doubt, in common with many others around the world, can't necessarily see the way forward. But what I want to do is in charge of your path. I'm going to go back to a year that has been happening to give you a bit of a perspective on that, both and even also from a public perspective. And I do want to draw a distinction in the course of these remarks between what's been going on in Australia versus what is going on in the world. But and then, and I'm sure that uh, I'll anticipate some of your questions because given the role that I have globally in Bolivia. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in relation to vaccines, and I know everyone's rightly interested in that. And then let's have a conversation, if we might, about how we manage in this context and what does the world look like going forward. So quite a lot to get, as I said, I do want to live happy to ask your questions. So when some of us got reports uh, in late December of unusual an unusual set of clusters of um, unusual pneumonia in China. Those of us who have a, a proxy interest in these sort of novel viruses had that sinking moment in the pit of our I, I've said this publicly, was in an airport in the United States um, on my way to a birthday bar in a ski resort, a friend of mine. And I had a phone call from my colleagues in London to tell me that they had been registered a series of very well, they thought, pneumonias in Wuhan. And I had calls before. And uh, on every occasion, the people who are interested in this uh, have been alert and alarmed for a period, and then whatever it is um, has tended to subside, and people have gone back to feeling a little more comfortable. As we know, in this instance, uh, that nasty feeling has continued because this is the event that those of us who worry about the viruses and the potential impact on the world event that we have been expecting. Now, I should say at the outset that the event most of us had been expecting was a new and virulent strain of flu. And I won't bore you with basically how our influenza virus reassorts uh, itself. But essentially, and if you be such as Bill Gates has taken a real interest in this over many years, I think there would be a general consensus that flu was the most likely uh, virus to a pandemic. But as it happens in this case, as you would be well aware, I'm sure by now, the virus that has caused uh, all this havoc is, and coronaviruses are quite common. They're not things that we are unaware of. Um, they most famously are uh, the sort that we've seen with the outbreak of SARS and the outbreak of MERS. Now, the thing that distinguishes this coronavirus, SARS, is um, is firstly, it's actually a much more effective virus. And by that I mean, it doesn't kill as many people as MERS. 
And that therefore means it's much more effective in that it is able to transmit itself from one person to the next without killing too many of its hosts. An effective virus doesn't kill off its host before it's effectively managed to replicate itself. So, and we don't know yet exactly what the actual case fatality rate will ultimately end up of COVID-19. Uh, certainly the experts are still thinking it's somewhere between one and maybe two percent. In the case of SARS, um, and moving death rates are between 30 and 60 percent. And there's a real key difference in this virus, which is worth reminding ourselves of. SARS and SARS infective, in other words, you could not give this disease to anybody else unless you were symptomatic, which ultimately meant if you develop symptoms in your team and that was an effective mechanism in terms of not spreading the disease, people wore personal protective equipment, etc., it would be brought under control. And everyone now understands very well from the public health messaging that you will have been seeing, essentially uh, do not know where this virus is going and all of the non farm interventions that you're being encouraged to observe and had outlined you this morning, um, stay in the seat if you're in the room that you are in at the moment. Um, eat from uh, boxes that are not shared. This will be more disposable uh, uh, plastic or, well, not that actually we should be using plastic, but paper, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we're not sharing sources. And we're not at risk of uh, any uh, virus being. So let's talk about basically what the response has been to date. And it's important to contrast the Australia response to the Canadian response with some of the others. And there will undoubtedly be many PhDs written on what was the right way to respond to this particular outbreak. Response to Australia is a very classical public health response, which imposes and seeks people to observe a series of prescriptions in relation to uh, the transmission of the disease and the following of non pharmaceutical interventions. And you would know these, I'm sure, very well now. Uh, obviously, uh, do not have uh, physical contact or indeed become too close to anybody else wherever it is possible. In practice, good hand hygiene. You've already had a description this morning about the use of a hand sanitizer around the room. Uh, we had the descriptions um, about basically not mingling too much. And we also know that things such as uh, hygiene, when coughs, things are very important. And unlike my generation, who was taught to cover our nose and our face with our hand when we actually sit in rooms like this. Um, of course, younger people these days are taught what is much more effective, and that is to actually use your elbow um, to sneeze in. The issue about us all doing the elbow bump when we meet somebody because we no longer shake hands, but I'll uh, put that to one side. So our public health response in terms of how you minimise spread, um, which now, of course, includes uh, our suggestion that you wear a mask, particularly at not distance. These things are pretty well understood and well accepted as making a difference. But of course we've gone further than that and there is an issue in Australia about what is an appropriately evidence-based approach and obviously here I'm talking about uh, the stages of lockdown and the issues of border closure. It is the case that in some uh, instances the public health response are particularly border closures are actually probably not uh, what you would mandate on a risk-based approach. And let me just draw a distinction here between uh, the job of the South Australian government versus the Northern Territory government. So the South Australian government basically has a blanket ban on people going in and out of the state unless you've got an exemption and there's a nominated list of exemption categories. And those are, for example, you're a member of parliament, um, you are a around Australia performing essential tasks and you are potentially, for example, somebody in need of health or medical care or you're 
So I'm in South Australia, I'm doing a national review of hotel quarantine. So as someone who is in Canberra um, and or southern New South Wales, um, I'm making an exception today in Sydney. Uh, but basically, I had to get an exemption to go to review hotel quarantine. Uh, that exemption required me to wear a mask when I was uh, anywhere outside my hotel accommodation in my meeting. And it also required that when I was not in my meetings, I was in a hotel and my hotel and I was in a hotel room. So pretty restrictive. Um, I was tested for COVID-19 on arrival and I'm pleased to report that I was COVID-19 negative. So they're pretty restrictive. People have seen a series of stories about the economic harm that has been done, particularly on border communities, but also more broadly in terms of access to, for example, agricultural workers who are needed to the agricultural cycle. And obviously that brings with it a series of challenges. So I'm going to contrast the position of the Territory. And the Northern Territory has adopted a risk-based approach so that um, if you have not been in a spot and there's a specific list of hotspots um, that is determined by uh, contact tracing, uh, it is one that is, so for example, in New South Wales, there are a series of nominated places where COVID positive 19 people have been for a period. Um, these are actually listed as places where either casual contacts or actual contacts uh, in those places are now required to isolate. That's accommodated. So if you go to the Northern Territory, obviously uh, you can go from Victoria, but you will do weeks of quarantine on arrival. But if you have uh, a location that is relatively COVID free and you attest, and there's a significant penalty to this, um, that you have not been hotspots, then you may go about your business. And I can say the plan that I went to the Northern Territory on, um, which had uh, from Canberra, Adelaide and the Territory was full. And in talking with uh, administrations, governments, etc., in, in all those jurisdictions. We discussed obviously the public health approach to this, but also we discussed what are the very real economic consequences from our, our response to. And we saw a seven percent drop uh, in uh, our economy over the last um, X months, three months, and we haven't fully got the necessary lockdown in Victoria, the stage four, and um, with the regional stage three lockdown. Downs. We know that the economic impact has been extreme. So the response to date, I would say to you, is um, pretty much according to public health dictum. In some instances, it goes further than that because it does a risk-based approach, um, but that is a, a function of the advice given by public health officials to uh, uh, the making these the, the uh, politicians and the ministers and the chief ministers and premiers who, of course, have a mandate to actually decide how to proceed. So the response, um, we've done very well in the COVID transmission in this country. Um, the Victorian outbreak, of course, probably the blot on the landscape in that respect. But it's worth, um, if you're not watching, looking at the out. Uh, uh, health officials and their very, very, very vigorous approach to tracing, which so far has enabled them to bring a series of clusters under control to enable people in the Sydney area to actually um, be able to do some business, not a really old fashioned normal way, but certainly to um, manage to conduct their lives. If we were Sweden and we had adopted the approach of taking and I think it's probably the case that is best known as the European year. Um, we've had uh, probably about 12,000 deaths now. And it's probably worth noting, and I, I won't have a profound or detailed knowledge of the Swedish economy, but it is a significant Swedish economy has uh, basically taken a significantly larger hit than ours, although I think that is still probably a work in progress. We'll wait and see. But you would be aware um, of the obvious comparator that I think many of us look to, and that situation in the United States. 
there's a little under 200,000 deaths in the United States. Um, they have had tens of millions of people who have been affected uh, with COVID-19. And on the projections from the institute that I serve on the board of in Seattle, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, um, we fully expect that we are up to 300,000 deaths in the United States by the time that the end of the year rolls around. So the competition between uh, Brazil and the United States for uh, most deaths, I think, is uh, very real, and it's not a competition that I particularly wants to participate in. But our economic uh, standing, of course, is crucial. Um, the cost to jobs. Um, the impact that that has, particularly on our younger generation, is real, as I think we would all understand. And so we do have to think and plan for the future. We do have to make sure that we keep our economy ticking over whilst uh, we figure out how it is we're going to best manage this disease. And I'm going to come to this question of vaccines, etc., in a minute. So job keeper and job seeker, and you will have seen that the legislation to extend job keeper. Um, um, past the Parliament in the last couple of days. And what that recognises is that we need to keep a lifeline out there, both to businesses but also importantly to individuals. Now I do think that we are seeing quite variable performance economically across the country. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you look particularly at Victoria, I mean the Victorian outcomes are really difficult, I think, and to consider how long it will take me to kickstart itself again be, I think, a watchword, a warning to all of us um, that all of us have a part in keeping this disease under control because none of us want the rest of the country to have to endure not just the personal difficulties of going into hard lockdown but the very, very real costs, the consequences of that. Western Australia, as an economy, um, they have a significant as well as um, income mining, and I can tell you, having been there as well recently to do my quarantine review, uh, that the Victorian economy is moving along just quite nicely, thank you very much. And uh, mining activity is continuing. Now, there are all sorts of very stringent measures being put in place to make sure that those continue to be safe and there's a level of uh, uh, self quarantining, um, very regular testing, etc. But that means that our exporting from those products continuing, and as a nation, that is unbelievably important. But there is no doubt this is the most challenging type of depression, and there is no playbook, there is no easy answer, there is no recipe that we can use uh, to ensure the kind which I'm sure that we would all wish, which is to get back to um, robust economic growth and a healthy economy with one thing as possible. So let me talk just very um, briefly, if I might, about what the prospects are in relation to how we might bring this um, virus to some sort of level of control. And I do want to start with a slight um, salt. Vaccines, to start with, take quite a long time as a general rule to develop. The fastest vaccine Vaccine that's been to date is um, a four-year turnaround. In many cases, vaccines take years and often over 10 years to develop. But these are not normal times. We also have a whole world and a whole scientific community very focused on bringing uh, the current circumstances in. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not remind you that there is currently no um, human vaccine for uh, coronavirus. Similarly, uh, that there are many diseases which you would be aware of where we do not have vaccines, not many years and years prior to, lead to HIV as the obvious example, or indeed the common cold. On the upside, HIV, uh, which we would all know started as a death sentence for most people who contracted it, actually has become a chronic disease become a chronic disease because we now have treatments um, that are effective and prophylactics in terms of drug therapies 
uh, would so the mechanisms we took early in the uh, scourge of HIV, which were the kind of public measures that I was outlining, of HIV that of course uh, safe sexual practice, the use of condoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it also relied on us, um, being very common mechanisms were, and as you would all know, I'm sure, uh, the transmission mechanisms for HIV are basically bodily fluids. They're not air is blood, uh, saliva, etc., that will transmit HIV. So once we figured out the mechanism of mission, we could advise people on how, in the absence of a drug therapy, they could minimise their prospect of actually contracting that virus. And as you would know, um, condom use, etc., uh, were things that were quite shocking for some people, I think, for us to talk about um, in the 80s. Uh, the notion of needle exchange when we started doing that in the Department of Health was highly controversial. Um, they, these things are now accepted as being um, standard part response to an infection and trial. And we do have a vaccine for that illness. But in relation to COVID-19, there are over two around the world working on vaccine candidates. Now, do I think that all or any of those are going to be successful? Well, I don't successful. But I would say that I think there is some prospect that some of them will be successful. Somewhere um, around the 96% of vaccine candidates fail in stage two or three of testing. So we have preclinical testing, we have stage one safety, stage two, phase two testing which is efficacy. And these are done on very small groups of people. And we have phase where you look across a much, much wider population to see whether a vaccine that has succeeded at phase one and phase two, whether it does provide protection and it has a low enough risk profile in terms of adverse events that it can assist the management of a particular disease, um, be it virus or, or what have you. And so um, we are now waiting. Uh, to see what happens with the vaccines that are currently in uh, the testing that schedule. So there are over 20 vaccine kits that are currently in human trial and a significant number uh, that are currently in phase three. But I don't think we should be um, too uh, blasé and think, oh, well, that's all fine. We're definitely going to get a vaccine. Because are difficult to make. This is not a chemistry experiment where you have a test tube, you get a series of um, uh, products like a recipe uh, and stick the test tube shake and there's the vaccine, voila. In many of these instances, the science to actually produce this vaccine is difficult. And in fact, uh, as somebody said to me the other day, most people don't realise that in most cases, these vaccines Vaccines, um, you are growing a living beast We're using a bioreactor to actually produce um, these vaccine candidates. So, so this is difficult engineering, it's a difficult science and it has to be done very, very carefully and according to what we call good manufacturing practice. So many of you know um, that the government has been focusing on two vaccine candidates, um, the first of which is the, known as the Ox vaccine, it will be globally produced and distributed by AstraZeneca. And then the other, of course, which is our own homegrown, and there are two options. One that's best known and probably is furthest advanced is the University of Queensland, what's known as the killer clamp vaccine. Uh, and that would be manufactured in Australia by CSL. And indeed, um, I think it's being announced today, so I don't think I'm telling you any secrets. Uh, uh, CSL will also be in a position to manufacture the Oxford vaccine as well from AstraZeneca, which is great news. But we do need to understand um, that just because you have gotten to the end of phase three, uh, that there will be very real questions about how a vaccine might be used who it might be used for, and indeed how long the efficacious. 
So I'm sitting on about 50% at the moment that there will ultimately be a successful vaccine. Which one it will be, I still think is out. Um, it is a question we cannot answer. Um, we know that the University of Queensland vaccine has come out of animal model work. It has gone into human trial and worked excellent. We know that the Oxford vaccine is in phase three trials. We don't yet know whether it works. In fact, I think it's important to understand, and vaccines are very complicated things, that if a vaccine um, produces an immune response, that's excellent for actually getting the disease. So we need a phase three trial because we need to understand whether that is the case. Does that immune response last or does it last only six months if it is protective? Because if it only lasts six months, it means that it's long as potentially against this disease. And it is certainly the case for the vaccine, um, based on my advice, uh, will not be able to be multiple times of the mechanisms that it uses. Uh, whereas the University of Queensland vaccine, for example, would be used every year. And much as you would all probably flu shots or some things that you have to have every year because the virus changes, etc., etc. The University of Queensland vaccine actually could be used every year in not quite the same, but in a similar way. So I think um, whilst we can um, be hopeful and optimistic about uh, the prospect of a vaccine, we need to temper that with the, slight, the slightly, um, it is still possible that no one will be able to develop a vaccine. Or if they are able to develop a vaccine, it may uh, only have the efficacy. The production of such a vaccine will take some time because what this is, we have to be able to find manager to manage our society that are robust, that actually enable us to continue um, with some form of our new lives whilst we actually attempt to uh, develop mechanisms to manage it. And that could include, in the way that I just outlined for HIV, that could include treatments and therapies that will turn COVID-19 into something which is an irritation, but not necessarily the same level of risk, particularly to our elderly, people who are immune compromised, um, and of course, our healthcare workers, who because of a higher level of disease, and you, you would be aware, particularly from reports from the United States, et cetera, um, that basically significant workers have died. Uh, from COVID-19. So we need to manage our expectations. We need to be thinking about what, what go forward plan is in the absence of a vaccine while we wait for treatments. Um, but we need to basically do that in a way that is just and, and that takes me really to what this means uh, in terms of how we think about our, how we conduct our lives, how we actually lead in a time like this. The truth of the matter is that everyone in the country is being required to rethink, to recalibrate and to reorient how they, uh, their workplace, uh, their lives in many instances. Uh, many of us, of course, are used to um, having a, a cadence to our life. For many of us, it involves lots of travel, lots of international travel. Um, for many of us, it involves endless meetings that are face-to-face. -face. Uh, for many of us, it will involve commercial activities that rely on a level of passing um, individuals, passing trade, et cetera, et cetera. All of those realities in this environment are brought into question and, in fact, in many cases, are challenged. So the challenge, I think, for all of us, and it's important to, I think, recognise that everybody in leadership role, and for all of us to double down and think about how it is we actually give people a sense of optimism and give them the skills, the tools and the mental uh, capacity to think through how it is they might operate in this 
new reality. And it is true uh, that in some instances it's necessary to manage um, an immediate of crisis. And for many people, I think the crisis management plan that they've had sitting somewhere in a bottom drawer and occasionally they've exercised, that crisis plan has had to come out. And of course, it's been found because that's what happens to management plans. Uh, but what we think we're all seeing right around the country is people um, very creatively. Uh, if you, of course, are a shareholder in Zoom, um, you've seen the most extraordinary appreciation of your stock because some companies have responded to the opportunity in this environment. For, but for many others, they've had to think really fast and on their feet, a scenario they had never even considered. And take, if you might, the worked example of toilet paper. Who would have thought that at a time of crisis, Australians would have resorted to the comfort purchase of far too much toilet paper? I don't think I have ever in, in government and since looking at crisis management, um, having exercised crisis management plans on May, not once did I ever hear a reference to toilet paper. And for whatever reason, and we can all that, um, it didn't make a lot of sense, uh, but it was a response to the concerns that our citizens had. Uh, and so as we know, shot off the shelves as soon as it arrived. So the grocery industry working with paper manufacturers had to, in a crisis management approach, actually all come together to work to find mechanisms to actually deal with what was a crisis. And that crisis basically became and was an important part of the crisis of confidence, which of course in and of itself then drives behaviour such as hoarding. Crisis management in that particular context, having uh, the key players, and I should say that the uh, National Code Commissioner would Commissioner had a role to play in this, bringing together sometimes some unusual um, colleagues. So uh, supermarkets, um, freight operators, uh, manufacturers, all of whom were tasked with trying to find ways to bring that supply challenge uh, to an end and therefore to enable people to have confidence that the supply chains would be up and running and that they could uh, purchase according to their normal schedule uh, and they, they need not uh, destock the shelves every time a six pack of Quilton appeared on the shelf. So crisis management has, I think, been tested through this period. We've all learnt a huge amount. We've learnt to expect the unexpected. We've learnt that we should have our crisis management plans and we should exercise them, but we should also understand that, in, that they are wrong. But we've learnt that it's unusual bedfellows and having the right people involved at the right time that can help you solve those challenges, particularly in the case of toilet paper. I mean, one of the things that had to be done very early is getting a, a basically a, a chain rate that heavy vehicles can't rumble through uh, the busy city streets in a number of our capital cities during the day because, of course, it's left to traffic. But if you're going to be able to restock in an environment where you're trying to recreate confidence, you actually have to get some of those rules and requirements. So where are we going? Um, the answer is we don't know yet. And we all hope that our glass are full, uh, that by the middle of next year, that we will be in a position to start to have a boxing that we will be able to start. Uh, but we don't know that. And so government, they do need to prepare and continue to maintain a posture, notwithstanding COVID fatigue, uh, that enables us to go about to the extent possible lives, uh, managing as best we can, ideally small outbreaks of this disease, uh, which are managed by a very proactive health response, such as we are seeing in Sydney, in order that the economy can continue to operate, 
in order that business business can continue to employ people. Importantly, that um, our young people are elderly can actually go about their lives, not the lives they were going about them, because obviously we can't put people in harm's way, but in order to basically have some notion of uh, regularity in how we live. But with a clear understanding and acknowledgement that if there is an outbreak close to us, uh, if we ourselves are infected, if we are unwell, we will get tested. And that will enable all of us to basically have something approximating a normal life and uh, stuck with a hard lockdown such as we're currently seeing in Victoria. So my glass half uh, full scenario is probably by the end of next year starting to emerge from this scenario. My glass half empty scenario says either that we can't find a viable vaccine or probably more likely uh, that the vaccines that are developed early will be less uh, helpful and they will be relevant for some people. And my glass half full scenario would suggest that the challenge of manufacturing and distribution, and there's a whole conversation if anybody's interested, I can give you a uh, down on that. And indeed, I'm doing a US public radio interview on that issue um, in about two hours. So I'm going to on that as well. I'll leave it there. Um, it's this is something, there's so many things that we could talk about, but why don't we leave now you to decide what you're about and what questions you'd like to pose. So I think that means, Scott, back to you. Thanks very much, Joanne. Um, can you hear me? Not really. Not really. <laughs> Let me just get the, uh, the mic to work. How's that? That's better. That's better. Now. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Jane uh, you mentioned before managing expectations is going to be something that's key. And you talked about your glass half full scenario and potentially the glass half empty. Um, you've got a lot of people uh, right now, obviously there's a bit of fear in the community, which we understand and we've been living with for a little while. Um, what are your tips for managing expectations? You're a great leader in this area. I think uh, our politicians are in the news daily having to manage expectations. Is it only glass half full? How is it that we properly manage expectations of our community? Well, I think to start with, actually being super really, really important. I think people having confidence that they get information that is accurate, um, that they're not being full uh, bill of goods which isn't reliable. I, I do think it's important that people can see um, the prospect of success and they know which needs are to, uh, to have that realised. I mean, as we all know, the internet in particular um, is awash with information that, um, information that is explicitly designed to undermine confidence and um, so I'm just going to look at our technical person and see if you've seen that message. Yeah, OK. Um, so essentially, uh, we, we know that, and it's not just individual conspiracy theorists uh, you know, who put stuff on the internet. Um, government agencies, bad actors, are also trying to undermine confidence. So I think having credible, honest, good communication from people who are trusted is really, really important. And let me give you an example of some of these things. And um, so I sit on the board of ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and we recently released a report about deliberate misinformation being put uh, out, we believe, by Russian services. That uh, misinformation was in respect of a completely mythical a vaccine trial, they claimed, for uh, a vaccine being developed by a company called Moderna. Now, Moderna, one of the CEPI companies, so CEPI, my not-for-profit globally, um, has got money in the Moderna vaccine development. They put uh, a report into uh, the Russian language um, websites um, that 
there had been a, a trial of a particular um, vaccine in the Ukraine and that half the people had the vaccine had died. Now, there was no trial uh, of the Moderna vaccine. Um, there was, and it, this is manifestly um, a lie and actually easily provable to be so. However, if you trace that initial report in a Russian language, on a Russian language website, um, it, it then wends its way, uh, turns itself into languages, and becomes, inverted commas, a credible and reliable report of the damage done by vaccines. So, so of course, that's designed to do what we can all speculate about, but what we can do is undermine confidence uh, that people have, and we all know that anti-vaxxers um, uh, have, for all sorts of reasons I, I do not profess to understand, very odd views about the evils of vaccines and the motive of companies who work on these things. Uh, but in truth and objectively, the evidence is undeniable. Vaccines are a, and particularly if they're approved by a competent regulator, and the TGA in Australia is a competent regulator, um, if they're approved by a competent regulator and for use in non nominances, they are one of the best interventions we have to manage disease. So thoughtful, clearly spoken, reliable, easy to understand um, advice, information, made available to people broadly, to my mind, is one of the important things. Now I do also, I would also say in answer to your question, um, that we need, <laughs> we need to understand that people of my generation um, don't always have the same um, communication channels and don't use the same information channels as people perhaps who are a bit younger than So we also need to think about how that information actually gets to all parts of our community, regardless of the language we speak, um, how it also gets to people whose sources of information, and given it's controversial at the moment, might as well go there, um, people who get their news on Facebook, get their news on Instagram. So we need to, and people who pay attention to influencers. So we have to basically think about not only the content, but also uh, the channel. Very difficult to have a oh, single... I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, it is difficult, I think, and yeah. we've seen it, to have a, a single source. Sorry. Uh, no. Scott, I can't hear a word. How's that? No? No. no. Sorry, Jane. Let me just see if I can get going. Working. Working. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, you can hear me, but I can't hear you. Someone in Brisbane's pulled a plug. <laughs> Hugh, you've got to love it. Operator error. How's do you that? do send a four or smoke signal, Scott? I could. Uh, I've got some questions written on the page, Shane. If you could please just yeah, answer yeah. them, that'd Hold be good. <laughs> How are we going? We right? Oh, there you are. Okay, excellent. Sorry for the interlude, everyone. Um, the single source of truth uh, is a difficulty. Um, I wonder this, and this is more of a, a general question. Jane, is there any other country that you look at to say, well, look, we're giving ourselves a pat on the back here uh, in each of our states and our country? Is there any other country you look to to say they did it well? Um, there are a number of countries that have done really well, actually. And um, some people will find this potentially surprising. Uh, but there are some Asian countries, and I'm thinking particularly of Vietnam, who have an unbelievably strong public health system, who have actually done quite well. Uh, so there are some countries, and it depends on your posture, um, it does depend on how porous your borders are. Australia is in a very unusual position, as is New Zealand, uh, who also done pretty well. But I think, I think what we need to remember here is that you need to look at the aggregate in terms of what well actually means. So New Zealand uh, had done really well in terms of um, no transmission. 
because then they have had the outbreak, which I think we're all watching with interest, and not know where that came from. And on genetic sequencing, it, it doesn't look like necessarily it came out of hotel quarantine. Um, so th there are always risks. And I think one of the things we need to remember here is if you do manage to do well, and so WA, no community transmission, the ACT, no community transmission. If we don't all continue to adopt the posture um, have been, the risk is that there will be some community transmission and it will have gone multiple generations of transmission underneath the radar before it pops up. And at that point, finding where it is can be quite difficult. So the distancing, the being tested if you're um, even slightly unwell, uh, with symptoms, and you will have seen, I think, uh, those exhortations from Victoria for people who are um, symptomatic, who aren't being tested for them to do so. The other thing that I think with other countries is this approach to risk. So the, da the Danes have a traffic light system. I think we've seen some discussion of traffic lights in the last couple of days about um, uh, amber and green in terms of the risk and a risk-based approach I mean, even to things like quarantine, to my mind, actually is where we need to go. So understanding who is more likely to be uh, at risk and who is less likely to be at risk, I think does help us. So there are those sorts of lessons. The other things I think we can learn from overseas are their approach to regimes. Because we are seeing particular people in a risk context, I think potentially means you can use uh, very scarce and expensive resources like quarantine. Uh, in a way which is much targeted. But no one country has got the right answer here, and I think that's the thing we need to remember. Every country is different um, ge geographically. Also, the time of year, uh, there is a reasonable suspicion that there is some seasonality to this, and by that I mean that, it, so of course, if that is true, what we're currently seeing in the United States is their summer outbreak. Um, so you worry about what might be happening. And, and in fact, the infection numbers are coming down at the moment in the United States. They were running at a bit under 100,000 a day. Um, they're down to a bit over half of that a day at the moment. So the clear trajectory in the US is down. Um, but what will happen when they get into winter, I think, is, um, is anybody's guess. So lots to learn and lots to improve on, I think. Thank you. Um, I'll break slightly with protocol in the sense that Given I do have Jane, as I said before, some people here in person, if anyone from this audience has got a question, I did invite you to deliver it via the app, but you're quite welcome in this room to ask me and I'll pass it on to Jane as long as she can hear me. Did anyone have any questions for Jane in this room before I just continue with my own questions to Jane? Susie? Jane, um, I don't know if you could hear that, but I'll just repeat it. Um, a, a question from the floor was, you were saying before that the border restrictions in Australia, state by state, at least, are probably a proportionate and risk-based approach. The question was whether or not Australia should adopt um, a stricter border regime in terms of international visitors and whether or not you consider that on an ongoing basis and maybe slightly different to other countries in the world and given we're an island, uh, is that an appropriate ongoing approach? No, in my view. Um, look, the, the challenge with here is we cannot completely close our border. Um, there are, in any in any circumstance, if we were to completely close our border, we would export an ore, um, we would send ore no wool, uh, we would not be able to export um, lobsters to the Japanese, so much damage that's being done at the moment, which is really significant. The notion that we could fully close our border ever, um, I, I mean, I, I cannot even contemplate what that would be like. So, no, it's not appropriate. Um, the cost of doing that would absolutely outweigh, uh, like, 
in fact, a huge margin, the cost of actually managing this in a very vigorous way. So the question we've got is what is necessary, both for humanitarian reasons, I mean, there are reportedly 100,000 Australians offshore who want to come home and who cannot get them. Not there are some people who we need to come in. So an example that was given to me the other day is a German um, very high skilled technician needed uh, for the boring equipment that are currently boring the tunnels for um, further transport infrastructure in Sydney. There's nobody in the country who can do the kind of maintenance work on, and you've probably all seen it, that you know enormous round boring. There's only um, there's no one in the country who can do the work on, on that uh, tunnel boring machine. So if it does not work, all of the people who are currently continuing to do jobs, um, uh, you know, all the appropriate safety precautions that they can and are in that building site, none of all would be able to be employed. So if we start to think about the implications of this, and I think this is one of the challenge for, challenges for us because it's an easy populist line to say, oh, well, we should just shut all the borders. But I don't think people, to be honest with you, are fully the consequences in the domestic issues. I mean, we're starting to see those terrible stories um, about that poor woman who lost the twin, um, you know, other circumstances. And the way this is playing out in people's lives, I, I, I do think is something that has to be thought through. But a lot of that cost is still actually skewered by job keeper and job seeker. And so I think we have to have a proportionate risk-based, fully thought through approach so that we can continue to do the things that we need to do as a nation. I mean, we are a wealthy nation, but in common with everyone else, we're becoming less the day and we don't want to end up with literally the smoking ruins of our economy with the public and personal price that people are paying including our expats who um, for whatever reason want or need to come home. There was a woman who was coming to Australia um, when I was uh, at an airport recently. That woman was coming back because she was about to turn the machines off on for her son who was um, tragically involved in a terrible accident. Now, I, I personally think that is, I want to use the word inconceivable, but I mean, everything I suppose is conceivable, but I personally think it is not real for us to adopt a posture where we have to say to a woman of that sort, no, you can't come home. And look, we don't know no, and look on this, how people can come and go and be managed in quarantine. And all but the truth of the matter is, um, we can, if we do it properly, I believe, actually have a posture going forward uh, that actually is sustainable while we wait for treatments and vaccines, etc., um, and while we manage and minimise wherever possible the economic cost of these arrangements. But I do believe that a completely hard lockdown across our borders is absolutely not possible nor desirable. Another question, yes, Brian. I understand. Uh, Jane, it was a question in relation to aged care, um, which I think affects a lot of us, certainly in this room and online, um, with our own families and those that we know. And I guess the question was, we're interested in your views as to whether or not there is a risk-based approach which seeks to minimise the exposure, for example, to those members of our community 
uh, who are in aged care or the elderly, while at the same time having a lesser approach for the remainder of the community? I think, Brian, what's your question? Yeah, okay. and, and that's a really good question. I think it's, again, important to put some facts on the table. A significant proportion of the people who've died in Sweden are actually people who are resident in aged care. So why did that happen? So they had a kind of pretty much, um, well, be a bit careful in your outdoors, let it rip strategy. And uh, as a consequence, the work in aged care about letting it rip. And what happened was they took the disease into aged care services. And so the, the problem we've got is you cannot um, put the people who work in aged care into one hemisphere uh, and put everybody else in a different hemisphere. The people who work in aged care are, um, you know, live in households, they have families, um, they go to the pub, they go and have a coffee, uh, you know, they have a casual conversation with somebody, they travel on the bus. And so the danger we've got here is the notion that we can just literally out of our society. So whatever um, there's a lot of virus running around, the risk is, and of course, once you get the disease into an aged care service, um, it's very different. If you think about the circumstances of Victoria, there have been a number of aged care services that have had one or two cases and they've done really, really well at keeping it under control. But the problem you've got is when um, a significant bunch of people uh, who work in aged care are themselves contacts or have developed um, have contracted COVID-19, you effectively end up taking out an entire workforce if you are going to actually adequately protect um, residents of that service. So from a practical, if you think this from a straight out operational management perspective, it's really, really difficult to say, well, we're just going to let everyone else let it rip uh, and then we'll just kind of, it's exactly the same as the Australian border, right? So, so essentially we're just going to ring fence around all these aged care services. The trouble is people have to go in and they have to come. They have to feed people, they have to care for people, and then they have to go home on the bus to their families. And even if they are personally careful, um, the, the reason that their families will be bringing virus in and out, and therefore they will bring virus in and out. And it is true um, that uh, you could say to every aged care worker, well, you have to be fully PPE'd um, single time you walk into a service, um, that will reduce some of that risk, but it won't completely eliminate it. So, so I do think um, a posture on aged care, which is a kind of quasi lockdown, and we're seeing that happen in a number of places. You would have seen land, um, to Jeanette, uh, the Queensland show, uh, talking about the locking down of aged care services uh, while they're trying to get that cluster under control. That's perfectly sensible because you don't want inadvertently someone from the community who doesn't know they're COVID positive turning up in an aged care service and, and infecting that person. But it's a much more complex statistical exercise. And just one other thing to remind you, if I might, um, the notion that the only bad outcome from COVID-19 is death. Oh, well, it's one to two percent. No, it's not too bad. Um, we don't know enough about this disease. And certainly we are starting to see evidence that the longer term implications of COVID-19, particularly in respect of damage, uh, damage to lungs, um, we don't yet fully know exactly what the longer term consequences of having COVID-19 are. So I, I think the use of the word risk, I mean, yes, we can talk about risk of death because we understand that. We don't understand the other risks. And certainly, um, I mean, I'm a degree since I psychology, the doctors I work with, they are all hyper-cautious, even if they're younger. Why? Because they don't know if they were to contract it, whether it would affect their health long term. And certainly there is some evidence that there may be those longer term consequences. Yeah, one final question. I'll give um, the opportunity to our online participants. This is in a similar vein though, Jane. So, um, yep, yep. There's a push by the federal government to convince the states to adopt a hotspot view of managing the outbreaks. What do you think is the chance of that discussion being successful? <laughs> well, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, you have a, a public posture from some people which is not supported by the evidence. 
and therefore um, it will take, I think, some considerable level of discussion and compromise to get what I think personally is needed, which is a national approach to hotspots and an approach um, to, to how we let the country operate. Um, now, it does rely, obviously, on continuing with a high level of testing and a high level of competent uh, contact tracing, because I would be the first person to argue if um, it can escalate in a particular geography or a state, um, that I would be looking not to let people from those areas um, travel, move away, that probably in a normal life you would. Um, I'm not that optimistic, I, I will be honest, about being able to achieve that. I think we would all be different, but I'm feeling particularly optimistic at the moment, which I know is, is it's not my normal demeanour. I normally look to the glass half full, but um, I just think we've seen some behaviours in the recent past which aren't based on evidence, um, they're based on whatever you choose to think they might be based on, but um, I think sadly they're not evidence-based. Well, I think that um, that brings us to the conclusion of our Q&A. Jane, best of luck in singing our praises and hopefully yours to the United States in a couple of hours' time. Um, but yep. we yeah. are very, very grateful um, for your presentation today. You really are at the pointy end for our country. Um, so we're very grateful for your insight uh, and we thank you very much. That's my pleasure. Thanks, Jane. Uh, and now we'll just move into a break before our next session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>